chapter 37. It was the third day after leaving the prisons at Dunphy Aaron before Yer and the little company from Colhaven reached the towering mountain range they called the Ravenswood. And able to use the open roads, they ran close to the banks of the Silver River as it wound south out of the mountains for fear of being seen. They were forced to traverse the deep forests above, picking their way at a slower pace through the tangled wilderness. The rains finally ceased on the second day out, slowed to a drizzle by mid-morning, and turned to mist by noon. The air warmed as the skies cleared, and the clouds drifted east. When darkness slipped across the land, the moon and stars became visible through the trees. Their pace was slow, even after the rains had subsided, for the saturated earth could not absorb all of the surface water they had gathered and the ground was muddied and slick with it. Stopping only for short periods of time to rest and eat, the company did its best to ignore the poor travel condition and resolutely pressed ahead. The sun appeared on the third day, brilliant and warm, filtering down in friendly streamers through the forest shadows. Returning bits and pieces of colour to the sodden land, the dark mass of the Ravenstone came into view, barren rock rising up, above the tree line. All morning they worked their way toward it. Then on through the noonday and by mid-afternoon they had reached the lower slopes and were starting up. It was then that Slant had brought them to a halt. We have a problem, he announced matter-of-factly. If we try to cross through these mountains it will take us days. Weeks, maybe. The only other way in is by following the Silver River upstream to its source at Heaven's Well. We can do that, if we're careful. But sooner or later, we will have to pass right under Greymark. Walkers will see us coming, for sure. Or I could frown. There must be a way we can slip past them. There isn't. Slanter grunted. I ought to know. Can we follow the river until we're close to Greymark and then cross into the mountains? Held us, his big frame lowering onto a boulder. Can we come at it from another direction? The gnome shook his head. Not from where we are. Greymark sits on a cliff shelf that overlooks the whole of the land about it. The ravens on the Silver River. Everything. Rock is barren and open. No cover at all. He glanced at Stitz, who sat sullenly to one side. That's why the lizards like it there. So well. Nothing could ever creep up on them. Then we'll have to go in at night, Gary Yak said softly. Again, Slanter shook his head. Break your neck if you try it. Cliffs are sheer drops all the way in, and the paths are narrow and guarded. You'll never make it. There was a long silence. Well, what do you suggest? Horek asked finally. Slanter shrugged. I don't suggest anything. I got you this far. The rest is up to you. Maybe the boy can hide you with his magic again. He lifted his eyebrows at here. How about it? Can you sing half the night? Yeah, Flush. There must be some way to get past the guard, Slanter. Oh, it's no problem for me, the gnome snipped. But the rest of you might have some trouble. Help. Has the night vision? Horeka began thoughtfully. But Gary Yaks cut him short, beckoning to Stitz. What suggestion would you make, Melwear? This is your home. What would you do? Stith let his littered eyes now. Find your own way, little peoples. Seek another foolish shade. Leaves me be. Garrett Yak studied him for a moment. Then walked over to him, wordlessly. 
grey eyes so cold that Yes stepped back involuntarily. The weapons master's finger lifted and came to rest on the Nowrat's cloak form. You seem to be telling me that you are no longer of any use to us, he said softly. The Nowrat seemed to shrink back within the robes then, slitted eyes glittering with hate. But he held no power over Gary Axe. The weapons master stood where he was, waiting. Then a low hiss escaped from the lids of mouth, then the forked tongue lipped out slowly. Helps you if you set me free, he whispered. Takes you when no one sees you. There was a long silence as the members of the little company glanced at one another suspiciously. Don't trust him, Slanter said. Stupid little gnomes, can I help you now? The sneer needs my help, little friends. No ways where no other can pass. What ways do you know? Gary asked, his voice still soft. But the male rat shook his head suddenly. Promise first to set me free, little people. Promise. The weapons master's lean face showed nothing of what he was thinking. If you can get us into Greymark, you go free. Slanter's face wrinkled with disapproval, and he spit into the earth. Standing with the others of the company, he waited for Stis to say something more. But the Maurat seemed to be thinking. You have our promise, for Raker interjected, a hint of impatience in his voice. Now tell us what way we must go. Stis grinned, an evil, unpleasant smile that appeared to be almost a grimace. Takes little people through caves of night. Why, you black! Slanter exploded in fury and came at the male rat in a rush. Help caught him about the waist as he tried to push past and haul him back. The gnome yelling and struggling as if he had gone mad. Stiff's laughter was a soft hiss as the members of the little company closed about him and to keep him back. What is it, gnome? Garrett Yaks demanded, one hand fastening about Slanter's arm. Do you know of these caves? Slanter wrenched himself free of the weapon master, though. Held still. Held still maintained his grip. The caves of night, Garrett Yaks. The gnome snarled. Death burns for the mountain gnomes since the time they fell under the rule of the lizards. Thousands of my people were given over to the caves, thrown within and lost. Now this monster would like, would do likewise with us. Gary Yax turned quickly back to the, the long knife appeared as if by magic in one hand. Be careful of your arms, but this time no way, he advised softly. But still seemed unperturbed. Lies from little known caves are passages in the Greymark. Takes you beneath the mountains, past the walkers. No one sees. Is there truly passage in? Porek asked Slanter. The gnome went suddenly still, rigid and held firm grip. <laughs> Doesn't matter if there is. The caves are no place for the living. Miles of tunnels cut within the ravens, or black as any pit. And filled with brocks. Have you heard of brocks? They are living things formed of magic older than the lands. Magic from the old world, it said. Living mouths of rock all through the caves. Everywhere you walk, the brocks are there in the cabin floor. One wrong step, and they open, swallowing you up, closing about you, crushing you into. He was shaking with fury. That was the way the lizards disposed of the mountain gnomes. Pushed them into the caves. 
to the cave do offer a passage through. Gary X turned Paul Raker's question into a statement of fact. Ah, passage useless to us. Slanter exploded once more. We can't see to find our way. A dozen steps into the prox would have us. Has not me, Stutz cut him short with a hiss. Mine is the secret of the caves of the heights. Little peoples cannot pass, but my peoples know the way. Prox cannot harm us. They were all still then. Gary X stalked back to stand before the Mulrat. The caves of night run to the run to Greymark beneath the Raven's Horn. Safe from the eyes of the walker. And you can lead us through? Yes, little friends, Stus rats softly. Takes you through. Gary X turned to the other. For a moment no one spoke. Then Hilk gave a quick nod. There are only six of us. If we are to have any chance at all, we have to reach the fortress, son, see? Four Acre and a Dane and Lesser Dale nodded as well. Yeah, looked at Slanter. Ah, you old fools, the gnome exclaimed bitterly. Blind, stupid fools. You can't trust the lizards. There was an awkward silence. You don't have to go any further if you don't want to, Slanter. Yeah, told him. The gnome stiffened. I can take care of myself, boy. I know, I, I just thought that. Well, keep your thoughts to yourself. Yeah, they cut him short. As for not going any farther, you'd better be off taking that advice yourself. But you won't, I'm sure. So we'll all be fools together. He glanced up at it stiff. But this fool will be keeping a close watch. And if anything goes wrong in this, I'll be there to make certain the lizard doesn't see the end of it. Gary Yaks turned back to Stu. You'll take us through then, Melrat? Just remember, it will be as the gnome says. What happens to us happens as well to you. Don't play games with us if you try. Stiff's smile was quick and hard. No games with you, little friends. They waited until nightfall to resume their journey, then slipped down out of the rocks above the Silver River and turned north into the mountains. Light from the gibbous moon and stars brightened the dark mass of the raven's horn as it rose about them. Great barren peaks towering against the deep blue of the skyline. A worn pathway ran parallel to the river bank through a scattering of trees and brush, and the little company from Calhaven followed it in until the forest lived south was lost from view. All night they were help and slanter in the lead, the others following in cautious sight. The dark peaks drew steadily closer about the channel of the Silver River to wall them in. Save for the steady rush of the river, it was oddly silent within these peaks. A deep and pervasive stillness wrapping about the barren rock as Mother Nature cradled her sleeping child. As the hours slipped away, Year found himself growing increasingly uneasy with the silence, staring about at the massive walls of rock, peering into the shadows and searching for something he could not see. Yet sense was there, watching. The company chanced upon no other living creature that night, save for the great cliff birds that winged silently overhead, across their nocturnal haunts, and still the Valmen sensed that they were not alone. A part of this feeling sprang, he knew, from the continued presence of stiff trailing. He could see the black figure of the Malrat immediately in front of him. He could feel the creature's green eyes constantly shifting to find him. Watching, waiting. Like Slanter, he did not trust the Malrat. Whatever promises Stiff might have made to aid them, Year was certain that behind it all lay a ruthless determination to gain mastery over the Velman's elven magic. Whatever else happened, the creature meant to have that power. The certainty of it was frightening. 
the days he had spent walled away in the prisons at Dunfermline haunted him like a spectre so terrible that nothing could ever entirely banish him. It was Stith who was responsible for that spectre, and Stith who would see life breathe back into it once more. While Year now seemed free of the Melrath, he could not shake the feeling that in some insidious way the creature had not lost control of him entirely. But as night lengthened into early morning, and weariness blunted the sharp edge of his doubt and his fear, Year found himself thinking instead of Bryn. In his mind he saw her face again, as he had seen it twice so recently in the vision crystal, once ravaged as she experienced some unspeakable grief, once awestruck as she looked upon the twisted image of a swap in the form of the shade. Glimpses only, those two brief visions, and nothing in either could tell the Valman what had come to pass. Much had befallen his sister, he sensed some of it frightening, an empty feeling opening within him as he thought of her, gone so long now from the Vale and from him on a quest that the King of the Silver River had said would cause her to be lost. It was odd, but in a sense she seemed already lost to him, for the distance and the time that separated them was strangely magnified by the events that had transpired since last he had seen her. So much had happened, and he was so far from what and who he had been. The emptiness grew suddenly into an ache. What if the King of the Silver River had misjudged him? What if he were to fail and bring to be lost to him? What if he were to come to her too late? He bit his lip against such thoughts, swearing fiercely that it would not be so. Deep ties bound him to her, brother to sister, ties of family, of a life shared of knowledge, understanding and caring, most of all, ties of love. They marched on through the dark of early morning, with the first light of dawn, Stiths took the company up into the rock, moving away from the Silver River where it turned dark and sluggish in its channel. They passed deep into the cliffs. Trees and shrubs disappeared and barren rocks stretched away on all sides. Sunlight broke east above the mountain's edge, a brilliant blinding gold that flared through the cracks and split to the rock like fire. They climbed toward the fire until suddenly, unexpectedly, the ascent, took them into a cliff's dark shadow, and they stood at the entrance of an enormous cavern. Caves of night, this is softly. The cavern yawned before the little company like an open moor. Jagged rocks split and twisted about the passageway like teeth. Wind blew down across the mountain heights, and it seemed as if it whistled at them from out of the caves. Lengths of dull whitish wood lay scattered about the entry as if it was stripped by age and weather. Yeah, looked closer and froze. The lengths of wood were bones, splintered, broken and bleached of life. Gary Yak placed himself before Stiff. How are we to see anything in there, Melrad? Have you torches? Stiff slung, low and evil. <laughs> torches? Not burn in the caves, little friend. Needs the magic. The weapon master glanced back momentarily at the cavern entrance. And you have this magic? Have it indeed. The other answered, arms folding within the rope, body swelling slightly. Has the firewick lies within. How long will this take? Ulrika asked uneasily. Dorbs were not fond of close places, and he was less than anxious to adventure into this one. Pass through caves quickly, little friends. Stiffs reassured rather too eagerly. Takes you through in three hours. Quaymark waits for us. The members of the little company glanced at one another and at the cavern entrance. I'm telling you, you can't trust him, Slander warned yet again. Garrett Yax produced a length of rope and tied one end about himself and the other about Stiff. Testing the knots that bound them, he slipped free of the long knife. 
I will be closer to you than your shadow, Lord. Remember that. Now take us in there and show us your magic. Stiff started to turn, but the weapon master yanked him about. Not too far in. Not until we see what you can do. The Melrat grins. So whose little friends come? He slouched towards the monstrous black entry to the cave. Gary Yak stepped behind him and the rope about their waist binding them as one. Slanter followed them at once. After a moment's hesitation, the others of the little company also followed. Sunlight fell away as the shadows about them deepened. They passed into the stone moor and the darkness beyond. For a few moments, the dawn's faint light aided them in their progress, silhouetting the shapes of wall, floors, jagged, stalactite, and clustered rocks. Then quickly, even that small light began to fail, and the blackness swallowed them. Now, they were practically blind, and their steps faltered to a ragged halt. The scraping of leather boots and rock, a rough echo in the cavern's silence. They stood in a knot and listened to the echo die. The sound of dripping water reached their ears from somewhere deep within the blackness ahead. And from deeper still came the unpleasant sound of rock grating against rock. See, little friends, this has suddenly all oh, is black in the caves. He glanced about and he was seeing almost nothing. Beside him, at Danny Lissadell's lean open face was a faint shadow. There was a curious dampness to the air, a clinging wetness that stirred, though there was no wind, and seemed to wrap and twist about them. It had, it had an unpleasant feel, and it smelled of rot. The Valman wrinkled his nose in disdain, realizing that it was the same smell that had been present in stiff cell at Capel. Calls now for the firewake. The male rat rest, startling the velvet. Listen, calls now the light. He cried out sharply, a kind of grim hollow whistle that sounded of bone scraping, rough and tortured. The whistle rang through the blackness, carrying deep into the cave. It echoed long and mournful, and then the male rat repeated it a second time. Yes, yeah, shivered. He was liking this whole idea. He was liking this whole idea of the caves less and less. Then abruptly the fire wake came and flew at them through the darkness like a gathering of brilliant dust, bits of iridescent fire, whirling and sailing on wind, and that wasn't there. Scattered through the blackness as it darted toward them, it drew together in a rush before the Malrat's outstretched hand, tiny particles swirling in a titan ball of light that cast its yellow glow outward to brighten the shadows of the cave. The members of the little company stared in astonishment as the fire wake gathered and hung suspended before stood, and against their faces the strange glow flickered and danced. Magics of my own little friends! Stiff's hiss triumphant. The snouted face turned to face, yeah, green eyes gleaming in the whirling light. See how the fire wake obeys! Gary Yak stepped quickly between them. Point the way, Melrat. Time slips from us. Slips quickly, it does. The other ras ra rasped softly. They pressed on into the darkness, the firewake lighting their path forward. The walls of the cave of night rose higher about them, lost finally in shadowed gloom that even the firewake could not penetrate. From out of the gloom, the sound of their footfalls fell back upon them in strange, sullen echo. The small grew worse, the smell grew worse, the deeper they went in. Turning foul the air they breathed and forcing them to take shortened breaths to avoid gagging. The passageway split and divided before them into dozens of corridors intertwined in an impossible maze of tunnels. But Stis did not slow, choosing without hesitation the tunnel he would have them follow. The glowing dust of the fireway danced on before them. Time dragged past, still the tunnels and passageways wore on. Endless black openings in the rock. The smell grew even worse, and now the sound of grating rock was no longer distant, but unpleasantly close at hand. 
then suddenly stood drew to a halt at an entrance leading into a particularly massive cavern. The fire wake dancing close as he lifted hand. Pax, he whispered. He cast the fire away from him with a snap of his wrist and it flew into the cave ahead, lighting the impenetrable blackness. The members of the little company from Calhaven stared in horror at what the light revealed. There, dotting the whole of the cabin floor, were hundreds of jagged, gaping fissures that opened and closed as their mouths engaged in some hideous chewing, the rock running hatefully in the dark. Sounds came from those from within those mouths, gurgling rushes, rendings, deep groaning, belches of liquid and crushed stone. Shades, they heard help whisper, the whole cabin floor is alive. Must pass through, Stiths announced with an ugly grin. Little peoples, stay close. They stayed practically on top of one another. Pale faces gleaming with sweat in the light of the fireway, eyes fixed on the cabin floor before them. Again, Stiths led Gary Yaks a step behind Slanter, Yeah, Dan Lesserdale, and Helped in a line following, and Four Acre trailing. They made their way in a slow, twisting path into the midst of the prop, stepping where the fireway showed the black mouth not to be. Their ears and mind filled with the sound those terrible mouths made. The procs opened and closed all about them as if it waiting to be fed. Hungry animals that sensed the presence of food. At times they closed so tightly that they seemed a part of the cabin floor that was solid. No more than the thin lines in the roughened stone. Yet they could open quickly, snatching away the seemingly safe ground off it, ready to swallow anything that ventured above. But each time, one lay hidden on the path ahead. The firework sh slowed. The members of the company were it waited and guided them carefully past. They passed from the first cabin into another, and after that into another. Still the props were there with them, dotting the floor of every cave and passageway, so that none was safe to traverse. They moved slowly now, and the minutes dragged away in a seemingly endless passage of time. Weariness set in as their concentration intensified, each knowing that a single misstep would be the last. All the while the props opened and closed about them, grinding in gleeful anticipation. There is no end to this maze, Helia Dane Elizabeth whispered once in frustration to year. The Valman nodded in helpless agreement, four acre press close behind now, and help brought up the rear. The dwarf's bare face was soaked with sweat, and his hard eyes were glittering. A concealed prop opened suddenly, almost a year's peak, its black maw yawning. Frantically, the bellman jerked away, stumbling into slander. The prop had been right next to him, and he hadn't seen it. He fought back against the wave of disgust and fear that swept over him, and set his jaw determinedly. It would not be much longer. They would be clear soon. But then, as they were passing through yet another cavern, through yet another maze of procs, this did what Slanter had warned all along he would do. It happened so quickly that not even Gary Yaks had time to act. One moment they were all together, easing past the hideously grinding fissures, and the next, the Murad's hand flipped suddenly backward, casting the fireway directly into their faces. It came at them in a flare of brilliant light, Scattering. Instinctively, they turned away, shielding their eyes. And in that instant, Stitz moved. He leaped past Gary Yaks and slanted to where Yer crouched, snatching the veilman about the waist with one powerful arm. The lizard creature slipped the wicked looking knife from somewhere beneath the dark road where he had kept it hidden and pressed it close against his captain's throat. Stay back, little friend. <laughs> The Marriott hissed, turning to face them as the fire wake again gathered before him. No one moved. Gary Yaks crouched barely two yards away, a black shadow poised to spring. The length of the rope still bound him to the Marriott, stuffed to get the valmen between them, the knife glittering in the half light. Foolish little peoples, the monster rasped, 
thinks to use me against my will, sees now what lies ahead for you. Now I told you he couldn't be trusted. Slander cried out in fury. He started forward, but a warning hiss from the male rat brought him to a halt instantly. Behind him, the others of the little company stood frozen in a tight circle. Help, Four Acre, and Edana Lassadell. All about them, the prop continued to grind steadily, stone grating on stone. Gary Yak shifted from the crash, grey eyes so cold that Stiff's arm tightened further about yet. Let the Valman go, Melrat, the weapons master said softly. The blade of the knife pressed closer against Yeh's throat. Yeh swallowed and tried to shrink away from it. Then his eyes met those of Garrett Yak. The weapons master was fast, faster than anyone. It was when he had confronted the gnome hunters who had taken Yeh prisoner in the Black Oak that he had first shown how fast he could be. And the same look he had worn then was now in the lean, hard face, a calm, inscrutable look where only the eyes spoke of the death that was promised. Yeah, breathed a deep, slow breath. Garrett Yax was closer, but the knife of the Valman's throat was still closer. Magic belongs to us, not to little people's. Stiff's rasp in a quick, anxious whisper. Magic's to stand against the walkers. Little people cannot use it. Cannot use us. Stupid little people crush you like bugs. Let the Velman go, Gary Yaks repeated. The firework down and glimmered before the mill. A whirling cloud of shimmering dust. Stiff's green eyes drew into slits of hatred and he laughed softly. Let you go instead, black one. He snapped. He glanced quickly at Slanter. You little gnome, loose the tie that binds me to him. Slanter looked at Gary Yax, then looked back again. His eyes shifted for just an instant to find you. The Valman read there, the Valman read there what was expected of him. If he hoped to get out of this alive, he was going to have to do something to help. Slowly, Slanter came forward, a step at a time, slipping the long knife from his belt. No one else moved. Yeah, steadied himself. Fighting back against the fear and repulsion that coursed through him. Slanter came close. Another step. One hand reached for the slack of rope that bound the Malrat to Garrett Yang. Yeah, went perfectly still. One chance was all that he would get. Slanter's hand closed about the rope and the knife lifted to the hilt. Then Yeh sang a quick, sharp cry that Slanter recognized at once. Dozens of grey hairy spiders clustered him. On stiffs crawling over the arm that held the knife to Yeh's throat. The Malrat jerked his arm away with a bolt, beating it wildly against his robes in an effort to dislodge the things that clung to it. Abruptly, the fireworks scattered in a wide circle, taking back the light and throwing everything into shadow. Cat quick, Slanter threw himself on stiff, burying his long knife into the arm that gripped Yeah about his waist. That arm, too, jerked away, and Yeah tumbled to the roughened stone. Free again, shouts rose from the others of the little company as they charged forward to pull him clear. Stiffs flew backwards onto the cabin floor. Slanter clinging to him, Garrett yaks leaping up. A long knife appeared in the weapons master's hand as he sought to cut through the rope that bound him to the Malrat. But he was yanked off balance as the rope snapped taut. He lost his footing and skidded to his knee. Slanter! Yeah, screamed. The gnome and the Malrat stumbled through the maze of props, clawing wildly at each other. The fire weight continued to rise as Stiff's control over it slipped away, and the entire cavern was rapidly falling into shadow. Another few seconds and no one would be able to see anything. Gnome! Boraker cried in warning. Break away from the others! To where the two forms struggled. But Gary Yax was quicker. He leaped like a shadow from the gloom, his footing regained. The long knife severed the rope about his waist with a single cut. Prox grated and snapped in response to the sounds above. Dark moors working madly. Stiths and Slanter were directly in their midst, squirming closer, slipping. And then Gary Yax reached them, flinging himself across the remaining space that separated them. His iron grip fastened on Slanter's leg. With a yank, he tore the gnome free from Stiths. 
claws, clothing shredded and ripped, and a frightful hiss burst from Stith's throat. The male rat tumbled back and thrown off balance. Beneath him, Proc's black maw gaped open. The lizard seemed to hang, suspended for an instant, clawed fingers grasping at the air. Then he felt disappearing from sight. The prop closed, and there was a sudden shriek. Then the black fissure began to grind, a terrible crunching, and the whole of the cabin was filled with dreadful sound. Instantly, the firewake scattered and fled back into the gloom, taking with it the precious light. The caves of night were plunged into darkness once more. It was several minutes before anyone moved again. They crouched where they were in the blackness, waiting for their eyes to adjust to the absence of light, listening to the sounds of the prop grinding all about them. When it quickly became apparent that there was not even the smallest amount of light to allow their eyes to adjust, El Poraka called out to the others and asked them to respond. One by one they called back, faceless voices in the impenetrable dark. All were there. But they knew that that they were not likely to be there for long. The firewake was gone. The light they so desperately needed to show them the path forward. Without it, they were blind. They must attempt to move through the maze of props using little more than instinct. Hopeless, Oreka announced at one. Without light, we cannot tell where the passage is open before us and we cannot choose our path, even if we escape the props. We will wander in these caves forever. There was a hint of fear in the dwarf's voice that Ye had never heard before. There has to be a way, he murmured, quietly as much to himself as to the others. Help! Can you use the night vision? Dana Lissadel asked hopefully. Can you see to find a way through this darkness? But the giant borderman could not. Even the night vision must have some light to aid it, he explained gently. In the absence of all light, the night vision was useless. They were quiet then for a time, bereft of it seemed of even the smallest hope. In the darkness, Yek could hear Slanter's rough voice, admonishing Garrett Yak that he should have known better than to trust the little lizard. As Slanter had told him, Ye yeah, listened and seemed to hear Bryn speaking to him as well, telling him that he too should have listened. He brushed the whisper of her voice from his mind, thinking as he did so, if the wish song served him as it did her, he could call back the fireway. But his song was only illusion, a pretense of what was real. Then he thought of the vision crystal. Calling excitedly to the others, he fumbled through his clothing until he found it still tucked safely away, dangling from its silver chain and he brought it forth into the cup of his hands. The crystal would give them light, all the light that was needed. With the crystal and health light vision to guide them, they would yet get clear of these caves. Barely able to suppress the excitement that coursed through him, he sang to the gift of the King of the Silver River and called forth the magic. The brilliant light sprang up, flooding the cavern with its glow, Bryn Omsford face appeared within it, dark, beautiful and warm, rising up before them in the gloom of the caves of night like some wraith come forth from another world. Grayness surrounded the surveil door, bloom all too reminiscent of their own, close and stiffly. Whatever she was, as she looked past them to her own future, it was no less hostile to a place than their own. Cautiously they Rejoin one another, gathering about the light of the crystal, joining hands as children might walk on a walk. Through some dark place, they began to move forward through the maze of prop. Year led, the light of the vision crystal sustained by his voice, scattering the shadows before them. Help followed a step behind, sharp eyes scanning the cabin floor, where the props lay hidden. Behind them, the others followed. They passed from the cabin into another, but this new cabin was smaller and the proper choice of passage less difficult to discern. Yes, song lifted, clear, strong, and filled with certainty. He knew now that they were going to escape these caves, and it was because of Bryn. He wanted to cry out in thanks to her image as it 
floated before them. How strange that she should come like this to save them. Closing his ears to the sounds of the props as they grated stone on stone. Closing his mind to everything but the light and the vision of his sister's face as it hung suspended before him. He gave himself over to the wish song magic and passed on through the darkness.